Jason, I'm going to go ahead and get started with uh, sharing a little PowerPoint uh, presentation that sort of gives a brief information and uh, perhaps you know, we can open for you know some discussion. And uh, so bear with me and I'm trying to use the technology. So as you guys know, I think you know the COVID-19 has become a, a, a pandemic and I believe it's going to be for a century that we'll be remembered. And uh, the worldwide uh, numbers are 98 million out of a population of 7.6 billion as of 2019. So you could imagine that I think we're slowly approaching to 100 million count of COVID infections. I hope you know, there is a healthy competition with the vaccine recipients that they surpass very soon. I'm not sure, but <laughs> it looks like you know, we are way behind. In terms of the deaths, you know, it's 2.1 million uh, people that got infected died. So we're basically looking at 2.1% uh, mortality. So that is really a, a big chance to take uh, for somebody who wants to uh, perhaps think that, you no, know, okay, well, I'm gonna take my chance, I'm gonna get the infection and I'm gonna be immunized. Well, you have a chance that you, know, you will die, you know, 2.1% time. So, but with vaccination, that's almost zero. And uh, leading the way, the United States you know, leads, and uh, then comes the India and Brazil, Russia, France. These are old numbers, so I don't have the more recent ones, but the, the world figures are current. All right, let's go to the... All right. Uh, <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about the history of pandemics. Uh, as you guys know that uh, I'm sure everybody heard about smallpox, but I'm not sure if anybody has seen a smallpox. That obviously shows the success of the first vaccine that ever was. And that was actually derived from cowpox. And as you know, uh, Edward Jenner, some of you guys may know, he's the one that actually in Britain, took a small piece of um, uh, the vesicle of cowpox and he took an injected in, in a healthy individual. And that healthy individuals after a little while got another small piece of uh, uh, <clears throat> smallpox lesion into the same person. And uh, interestingly, the person who had a cowpox so-called vaccination in, in, in the first time was immune to smallpox. So that was the, the beginning of this vaccination attempt. And so much so the Edward Jenner was called as the, the father of immunology. And actually at one time, you know, smallpox was a, a big uh, event. You know, just to give a little history uh, in Boston, where a small community of 11,000 people and almost like 55, 60% of them were infected with smallpox and 850 people died in, in those days. And uh, currently, you know, we have no smallpox and it was uh, all the, the end result of uh, 1972 large vaccination trials. So that was the beginning of uh, vaccination. And I wanted to present to you about the AIDS, which was a pandemic at one time it was, uh, uh, 10 leading cause of death in the United States, and uh, it still has got its around. But um, what I wanted to bring to your attention is this was a, a, a disease that's still present. We did not get a vaccine, but we were able to find the treatment. So effective treatment, so much so that I should say that uh, as an infectious disease doctor, that you know, in a month or two months, I'm told that there's going to be a, a one shot per month deal to treat the AIDS and that's such a tremendous progress we made in the treatment. So we not only need the importance of the, stress the importance of vaccination, but we also need to stress the importance of treatment because we have about uh, close to 100 million people infected and uh, you know, 2% of them, 2.1% 2, 2 of them have died. And in fact, right now in New Orleans, so uh, we have patients uh, pretty active, you know, a spike, I wouldn't say a big peak, 
but there is definitely uh, increased activity in West Chef and Turo hospitals. And uh, I'm very happy to mention that the mortality has dropped down dramatically because we got so many treatments to offer. I also wanted to, since now this is a presentation from New Orleans, and I'm not sure how many of you will remember that to know, New Orleans at one time is called as the necropolis, the city of the dead. We have had a tremendous wrath of uh, yellow fever in 1817 to 1905. 10% of the city would die from July to October. And it's got a lot of uh, history of our culture and America where there was a black slavery that was uh, pretty rampant. And uh, the myth was that the blacks are immune. So they actually marketed the black slavery. It's very unfortunate, that's not true. And the reason why I'm also saying yellow fever is it is possible for those people that have been uh, vaccinated with uh, COVID-19, when you get your card, please save it because thing is, it is possible that you know, we may be required when we travel. It may be the requirement to travel you know, all over. So yellow fever is still a, a, a traveler's uh, requirement you know, for vaccination to South Africa, if I remember correct. And so much so, the people that have uh, never been infected with the yellow fever, they were called strangers disease because they come to New Orleans and they die and they get infected with yellow fever. So that was a, a bad disease. And look at this is one of the pictures. It was so bad that you know, people would bleed all over, eyes, ears, from their fingers. So much so that you know, it was uh, uh, when, when the the preachers, you know, go to do their last uh, rites and stuff like that. They would, uh, they would be disgusted. In fact, the people that are dying used to use all foul language, filthy, because they were suffering miserably. So that was a yellow fever. Thank God that you no, know, we don't have it. So that is the, that is the impact of vaccination. Look at this vaccination. This is a more recent. Uh, vaccinees that know that I've got and unfortunately you know I don't have the more recent one but in Israel from what I heard yesterday was they're up to 38 percent of vaccination of their countrymen just imagine 38 percent one out of three Israelites I'm not sure if I'm going to say Israelites but uh, I would say the those who are in Israel have been vaccinated and they're even a small article that I read that has actually reduced their incidence of uh, COVID infections. And as you see that, you know, you have uh, second and third uh, Middle Eastern countries, Dubai, I mean, uh, UAE, Bahrain, they got the vaccine, they got uh, Pfizer vaccine. I think in Dubai, they also have, uh, you know, Chinese vaccines. So anyway, what I would like to say is that we are way down, like uh, I think it's we're like a fifth, five percent, or maybe a little bit more, because thing is this is an old number, so we need to get way up. A lot of people have the issues about the side effects. What about the side effects? Well, there were two deaths in India. This was an old uh, information that they have received two different kinds of vaccines: Covaxin and Covishield. A lot of them have minor side effects. There were two deaths unrelated to the vaccine. And uh, these are all the heroes that started. Dr. Klinsberg, he's the uh, section chief of pulmonology at Tulane. And uh, he's uh, Greg Williams, the podiatrist, uh, the friends of mine. And uh, somebody asked me that, no, why don't you have your picture? vaccination what am i celebrating this is you know my aunt she died young 57 years old it is so sad their family you know of seven extended family five of them were positive and one of the or perhaps the only breadwinner could not go to the hospital because he didn't have the money they had to gather some you know money to go to the hospital and Fortunately, he's alive and well, 
But what am I thankful for? This is another, you know, Brenner's no family. Leaving behind two young children. He's dead. There was a big myth that the Chinese numbers originally stated all the deaths were over infections as well as the deaths were over 65 years of age. That is not true. These are the two examples that I'm telling you. It is affected a lot younger people. Here is my boy, Prakash, who's, <laughs> who's smiling. And uh, he really is not smiling, actually, because he's infected with COVID. He's at uh, home, quarantined himself with Brenham. And uh, he started to be the big boy for this Camp Swan. And some of you guys know through the foundation that we have a camp. Uh, uh, I'm hoping that you know, Beth is here. So maybe very soon that uh, we may have uh, a camp in, in Gulfport. This is a camp for bereaved children uh, between 7 to 12. is a three-day, uh, two-night camp with uh, play therapy. Uh, music therapy, a lot of motivational activities. And it's just for the children to, to let them know that there are a lot more people around in a similar circumstances that you don't, you're not alone. And I am telling you this COVID-19 is gonna generate millions of children who have lost their parents, uh, grandparents, and a lot more. And they gotta be prepared, they're grieving. Thankfully that you no, know, the COVID has not affected children as much as the adult population. I'm actually gonna go ahead and skip uh, all the things uh, about the, how the vaccine works, but I wanna just give you a timeline as you probably heard about the, the warp speed, operation warp speed. This is, uh, this is perhaps the reason why we credited to have seen the first and the second vaccines in a matter of uh, nine to 10 months. There was even some political discussion that perhaps there would be a vaccine right before elections, but it did not happen. It, it did happen in, in December, like in the timeline that we've had a Pfizer vaccine and a week or you know later that there was a Moderna vaccine and both of them are being you know, used right now in the United States. And the way it is being distributed right now, we're in phase uh, 1B, which is uh, giving vaccination for people that are 70 and above and healthcare workers. And uh, they're trying to add these essential workers, like the, there was a demand by the teachers and others you know, to be the, you know, the essential workers. I'm not sure what's going to be the status, but with the change in in presidency that I think you know we may be seeing a lot more um, that uh, the next phase would be one C where would uh, drop the age to 65 and maybe add some additional uh, groups and then eventually to the general public where you know you can go to CVS Walgreens and get your shot uh, which uh, sadly is not going to happen till spring or maybe summer and uh, let's talk about it as to how we can actually enhance that, okay? So um, there are a lot of ethical principles that were, that were projected. And one of them was it was a very short span we got this vaccine. <coughs> and there was an issue about the, the safety. Uh, so far that uh, millions that have been vaccinated, there's no vaccine related death that I know of. And the, the last one, which is, you know, to promote the transparencies. Of course, that, you know, the, the two uh, vaccines studies of uh, Moderna, as well as Pfizer are reported in New England Journal of Medicine and peer reviewed by uh, experts in the, in the field of uh, virology, immunology and all those things. And uh, they have, uh, you know, agreed you now for this vaccination to move forward. Whereas uh, the other guys, you know, like uh, AstraZeneca, Zeneca, and there is a, a, a vaccine, you know, from my own uh, city of uh, my birth, Hyderabad city in India, it's called Bharat Biotech. It's a small company that's actually 
uh, have done the studies of vaccination and uh, they have published in uh, both AstraZeneca and this Bharat Biotech in uh, Lancet. And uh, we, we got to promote uh, justice and uh, mitigate the health inequalities. But unfortunately, we have so many myths and, uh, and then you know, fears that we're going to talk about that is it itself is uh, killing you know, uh, the vaccinees. And uh, this is a, I think this is a more recent va vaccination information. In the United States, we got a 41 million doses uh, distributed. Half of them were administered. So we still got a lot of doses that are still waiting. And I just heard that in fact, you know, the new president has released whatever the reserves that they, they are holding of the vaccine. So they're gonna keep all those reserves out because there was a concern that perhaps if we give the first dose, we may not have enough for the second dose. So they, want, they wanted to actually do a, a reserve the, the vaccines. But then you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna get into the, some discussion as to why it is not important. Let's, let's go and uh, briefly you know, go over a few uh, information about these vaccines. Um, I, I am requesting all the people to un, uh, mute, please. That way, you know, this will be clearly audible uh, presentation and that way all of us can benefit out of this. The Bharat Biotech is a, is a, a vaccine, vaccination company in Hyderabad City, India. They've actually come up with uh, phase one, phase two, and they uh -huh. actually have uh, a phase three trial that is uh, actually millions of uh, Indians have been uh, receiving this vaccination of a, a vaccine in trial, in trial mode. It's actually been approved on an emergency basis as, um, you know, I'm not very clear right now, is it a research trial or emergency vaccination information? So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about it. Some of us may have some information about it. So essentially in the phase one trial, there were 300 people vaccinated, 75% placebos, both sexes. They had no serious side effects and uh, they all had neutralizing antibodies, which are protective antibodies. And there was a 12 months follow-up. And uh, this is a phase two trial. And uh, they used like two different uh, groups of three micrograms and six microgram vaccination. Again, no serious side effects. This is only like six months follow-up. They now have phase three trials of this vaccination that has been given. Uh, there's one study that's still going on with I think you know, it's 20,000 people, but a lot of Indians have received at, at, to the tune of uh, maybe, uh, maybe half a million these uh, vaccine, which uh, some people complain that they haven't have the full efficacy data, but nevertheless, you know, they have they have given, and to my knowledge, you know, they have uh, not heard about any deaths, but there are some minor uh, effects. The Pfizer vaccine, as you know, studied forty three thousand people, twenty one percent, twenty one thousand vaccinees, and uh, twenty one thousand uh, placebos. So it's a fifty fifty, and uh, there was a 95% protection. A lot of them had pain at the injection site. There was a fatigue, headaches, uh, those kind of things in a two months follow-up. And as you see, this is, a, this is the first vaccine that's been approved. And Moderna vaccine is a research trial included 30,000 people. It was two doses, 28 days apart. and uh, there were 11 cases of COVID infection in the, vac in the vaccine group as against uh, <clears throat> 185 cases in placebo group. So obviously that there was a significant number of uh, uh, COVID infection in those people that did not receive the study vaccine. And uh, eventually I think, you know, the protection was 95% and they, they, a lot of them had pain at the injection site, fatigue, headaches, so that sort of thing. 
And the, the good news is none of them had a death. AstraZeneca has studied 23,848 participants. They had two doses, 28 days apart, and there were 10 cases of COVID infection in the vaccine group and 185 cases of uh, COVID infection in placebo group. And uh, it, it, uh, it included uh, everybody, um, both sexes and uh, <clears throat> The main uh, side effects was the pain at the injection site, just like the, any other vaccination, fatigue, headaches, and uh, it had a nine week follow-up and 62% uh, uh, protection. For, uh, and then you have a Sinovac uh, vaccine trial with the Chinese that they have actually, they didn't have enough uh, I guess I know for some reason that they actually did the study in Brazilians, Turkey, and I think in, uh, in Malaysia, one of those places. So in Brazilian participants, they actually had 13,000 participants. They had a 50.38 protection. So you might wonder as to why should we use uh, Sinovac? for a World Health Organization and even for an FDA requ requirement, you need to have 50% efficacy for a vaccine to be approved. And so here they are. So I think, you know, Sinovac may be approved, but I'm not sure. And then there's another uh, Chinese uh, vaccine called Sinopharm vaccine that was actually locally manufactured and uh, evidently has been studied in China. Uh, I don't know the details of it. There is actually a vaccine rollout information that uh, somebody published. Uh, it says that you know, vaccinating one in five people in hard hit places like giving priority to people over 60 years of age could bring the death rate. I'm talking about just the death rate, not the infection, by 73%. So it is not only the vaccine is not only going to reduce the number of COVID infections, but it will reduce the death rate among those people that who may still get infection with the vaccination. Now let's you now go ahead and then you know, I'm gonna give you a rundown a few things and I'm gonna close it and then invite you no know, discussion. There's one of the things that's very important is the conspiracy theory. Um, I'm sure that some of you guys heard about the Tuskegee experiment where they have injected the syphilis uh, uh, bacteria or spirochetes into the uh, black men and studied the natural course of uh, syphilis. And it's a sad uh, medical history of uh, this nation that uh, it still lingers in the minds of a large section of Americans that, uh, uh, that I want to assure them that as a physician, and as a medical community, you know, in the leadership role, there's nothing like that that's gonna happen because we have such a extensive checks and balances. And sadly that there are still some people that, you know, one of the janitor that I was talking to and then he, and I asked him, hey, why don't you take your vaccination? I said, doc, oh my God, they got something in it. And in fact, he threw the blame on Trump and said he did something and they got it out so fast I'm getting there. I'm not getting it. And that was his uh, excuse. And I said, oh, wow. And so do you need to still wear masks? Yes, you do, because these are not 100% effective. And uh, th there is a fear about the artism, birth control measure. Those are all very unfounded and nobody knows uh, where that's coming from. Thankfully, it is not that rampant. As you know that uh, Moderna and uh, Pfizer vaccines are RNA vaccines, uh, virus vaccines. And what happens is that there is a concern that some people believe that you know, they may actually create some autoimmune disease further down the line because it is gonna be like a genetic engineering. That is absolutely not true. This RNA, 
virus vaccine is going to have a temporary message. It will not modify your cell. It's very important, like a DNA. But what about the J&J and AstraZeneca viruses? They are DNA used in their virus vectors. Virus vectors means actually the virus of adenovirus is, uh, you know, is used to develop you know, this vaccine. And uh, so there again, you know, the, the message is temporary and uh, it is not gonna have a, a long lasting impact. And there is someone who I talked to was saying that no blacks are immune about Hello, that is totally false. And uh, there are a few side effects you know, uh, that you know, some people may have heard about. There were 29 deaths in Norway and all of them were receiving the Pfizer vaccines and the vaccine drive still continues and all of them are they died and were terminally ill. So they actually probably had a lot of reasons that they're counting their days. And uh, I am not sure no vaccine is related to that. And the country, you know, as investigated and had quick, took a quick decision to continue with the vaccine drive. There were five, uh, two deaths a uh, long time back. And of course, this is actually a uh, one week old uh, information. There were two deaths in India also that think, you know, there's unrelated to the vaccine. And as you understand that when we are injecting this vaccine in millions, there will be some deaths. And uh, that is probably not going to be related to the vaccine. So you have here, you have the Pfizer, Moderna, or the RNA vaccines, Johnson, Johnson, AstraZeneca, the DNA vaccines, or DNA derived. and uh, and I'm going to go ahead and hold off over here. I'm going to get back to the uh, real screen and uh, think, you know, let's go ahead and uh, talk. And uh, I'm going to invite, you know, one by one. So let's see that if you guys want to go ahead. Uh, uh, just please, you know, try to uh, mute all of you. And one by one, you know, if you can unmute and save words or add, you know, whatever you want to say, you know, because I have presented the history, I have presented the way vaccine is made, and I have presented these side effects, and I have presented the myths and facts. So any information that you have, this is a, a dialogue. So we want to make it, you know, like uh, as effective by letting all of us, you know, get in into it and say a few words and see what you think and, you know, and also, I want to let you guys know this uh, Zoom uh, uh, is recorded and we are going to actually modify it into a YouTube presentation. And guess what? I am going to have it uh, submitted to the National Library of Congress, whereby all these people that gathered over here have a serious concern to bring this COVID to an end. And this is what our children and their children needs to know that we have done what we need to do to get this pandemic under control. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop uh, my lecture <laughs> and invite you know, one by one. So you can just you know, go ahead and uh, please uh, identify yourself and uh, uh, go ahead and get started. Yeah, Corey from Minnesota. Um, could you explain, maybe I missed it if you did, uh, what was done different to get this vaccines, these vaccines on the market in less than a year? And how long does it usually take to get a vaccine developed? I, I'm an orthopedic standpoint, I don't remember all that. Thank you. Uh, that is an excellent question, but I think, you know, I don't want to go back on this uh, PowerPoint slides because the thing is that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very poor in technology. Just the smallpox vaccination that I just presented to you, it was a history of 100 years of development and vaccination and all those things. And you might wonder how the hell all this thing happened in less than you know one year, nine months. And that's one of the scary things for a lot of people. And the, the technology, there is a RNA technology that they used, especially the Pfizer. 
Pfizer actually started in the peak of the first uh, uh, pandemic in March, where they used RNA. You know, this is by the way that no, this RNA uh, technology is everything is synthetic. There's no natural, you know, virus uh, biological agent involved in it at all. So they are trying to use a synthetic RNA derived vaccine. So the technology is such that they are able to generate, synthesize very soon. And I don't know exactly how many days or weeks they got it and they got the phase one, phase two and phase three trials in, in a, such an order where by October uh, they have got it uh, presented uh, to the FDA and it got approved. So this was the RNA technology. And uh, luckily, or I don't know, I guess the time will tell, this is all um, is a biotech uh, marvel where there's nothing uh, that is live. There's no virus in at all. It's all synthetic. And that is the reason why that might actually give us a, a, a segue into a concern about the allergies. Now there is a, a polyethylene glycol, which is one of the chemical used in this uh, synthesis that may be responsible for allergy. And if so, uh, what people recommend or the experts recommend is, so far, there have been a few cases of uh, anaphylaxis, which is, as you know, that you know, people can die you know, with anaphylaxis, but all the few anaphylaxis that have happened with these vaccines have resolved and nobody died of it. So I have talked to uh, Dr. Penico in, in Gulfport and then he has seen uh, uh, like a, a large uh, allergic reaction on the site where you know, somebody got in, injected and that he took care of it with uh, steroids. So there really you know, wasn't a problem. So to answer your question, this is the technology that got to know this vaccination out so fast. Yeah. Uh, Shiva. Yeah, go ahead. One of the responses is that, that was a very good question, and that being asked everywhere, that why, how it had happened so quickly. One of the responses I have given to my patients and the friends is that they, in old days, the cars used to travel with this speed, our computer used to travel with this speed. Nowadays, I'm holding this telephone in my hands, talking to the people all over the world with them. So we have come a long way in technology. We've come a long way in technology, how it works. So the, the way the cars travel, where the computers are made. So because of that technology, we are able to synthesize the thing, make the thing more, uh, more quickly. So that's what my response will be, that the technology is different than it used to be long time ago when the other vaccines were developed. developed. It took a long time. You could just see certain things with the with the microscope. So you you were not able to see much more, much more minute, minutely than you were able to do it before. So for a simple person, that will be more understandable. That we have come a long way. It took longer time, more energy to develop the things earlier. Now it is more quickly because technology has come a long way. That's what you said, actually. Yeah. So. So for a simple person, it might be easier to understand than describing that the messenger RNA, DNA, outside, live virus, not live virus. Just simple, just telling them that this is because of the advances in technology. We have been able to do it more quickly than we have been able to do it before. I came in later in this uh, Zoom meeting, but I don't know if you clearly answered or had any slide about the second shot of the vaccine. When you've gotten the first shot, since uh, we know that there was no reserve or inadequate reserve, people might not be able to get the second shot up to two months, three months, or four months. Who knows? So how, what kind of immunity those people will have? You will end up losing the old immunity which you have, 
or you will still have the same effectiveness if you get the, the second vaccine shot later than it is supposed to be? That's an excellent question. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Arshad is actually a psychiatrist, so I think, you know, he's got um, his own story in a video and podcast about uh, the mental health uh, effect of this COVID-19. So some of you guys want to watch it. That's available on the, the akulafoundation.com. Now, the <clears throat> two things that you know, I want to address, one of them is uh, the technology. The old technology of growing the virus, killing the virus, and making it inactive, and then injecting is the technology that has been used in Bharat Biotech in India. And they also have actually shortened their course of the trials in the sense that was the reason why it took a little bit longer. So they were not able to get the phase one and uh, phase three trials you know, sooner, but they already finished phase one and phase two trials. In fact, they published in Lancet that they had excellent immune response, the good old fashioned way of killing the virus and injecting the viral particles back into the body. In fact, they are taking a next step. And that's the reason why they have used this bio, I mean, this uh, Bharat Biotech in India to inject this vaccination despite the not completing the phase three trials. They're actually taking one more step. They're saying if a vaccine is injected on the arm, the antibodies are gonna develop around there, but the virus infects or gets into the body through the nose and oral cavity. So they're actually proposing a vaccine study where like the polio vaccine, like the drops, they wanna put one drop in each nostril and see how the antibodies are developed and they're gonna block the entry of the COVID into the body. And so that is another trial that's coming up and that's gonna be exciting. If you're gonna have vaccination as it drops and which is gonna be a lot more effective. And as regards the, the reserve, it's a very good question. In fact, as a matter of fact, there's been you know, some uh, argument in the, in the community where if we, if we are not able to get to the whole uh, countries and continents by summer or spring, why not we just use what we have? Don't worry about the second dose. Well, will it gonna be effective? Yes. The number's not as, as much as 95% because the 95% results are, re are reported only after the second dose. So can the second dose be given after uh, 21 days for Pfizer or 28 days after Moderna? Yes, they can be given two months later, three months later, whenever. They're still going to be protected and they are going to contribute towards the herd immunity. And I, Julie, you know, some of you may have already heard, herd immunity is like, it's like a sheep. You have a whole bunch of sheep healthy that you know, the, the sick ones you know, are, are not gonna you know, manifest. So it's the same way that you got a lot of people, you know, already 100 million people infected. And hopefully we have more than you know, 100 vaccinated. So both of them together, they're increasing the herd immunity. So I think, you know, coming back to your point where we do have lack of uh, shots. So I think, you know, it may not be a bad idea to just hold off on the second dose and, and inject. In fact, there was a, uh, you know, there was some survey. I'm going to talk more about it. So I'm going to go and close it and invite somebody else to see if they have any other um, introduce and uh, say a few words or ask questions or, or if you have anything new to add. This so, is yeah, Dr. Varad. I think, Dr. I think um, I'm Amy Sandridge, and, and I think that that's exactly the concern. You know, so originally it rolls out and you've got to get two vaccines and you would have thought 
if I were conducting the study, if I were conducting the rollout, if I gave out 100 vaccines, then I would have a list and I would make sure that those 100 people could get their second dose. So to find out after people have already gotten their first dose that no one prepared well enough to provide a second dose makes me think, oh, this isn't very well organized. Now, if it's not very well organized, then what was the process behind it? What safeguards does the FDA had have? What safeguards do the pharmaceutical companies? So it's very disturbing to me to find out that there isn't enough vaccination in the reserve. And to me, it would make much more sense to do what was promised, which was you need to get a vaccine and then 28 days you need to get your second dose. But to leave people in this limbo, in this never, never land where they got the first vaccine, but now they have to wait two or three extra months because there was improper planning, you must admit that it would have been better to present it as you get one dose and then you, you can get the dose. I mean, it, just the lack of organization, the material I saw from both River Oaks and Odyssey House was you, Amy Sandridge, will get one vaccine and then there will be a list and 28 days later, you need to appear to get your second dose. And now that's changed. Amy, I, uh, I think that's really good. And it goes back to when you look at the Blacks, African-Americans, who, um, you know, perhaps not interested in getting the vaccine, this would be one thing that would probably hinder an individual. So one thing that I would like to see is that show me the data, like put the data when we're looking at CNN or other areas, show the data of who's gotten these vaccines, show the diverse population, how many Blacks, how many African-Americans, how many Asians, how many Caucasians who've gotten their first dose or who've not gotten a dose at all. And so we can see that, I'm just gonna give an example, that in this first dose, there was you know, African-American, Asians, and um, Hispanics who got the first dose, but now all of a sudden they can't get a second dose. This one you mentioned about integrity, that check and balance, you're not seeing it. And what Amy's saying is like, you promised me one thing, that's the reason I got the shot, but now I can't get the shot. So that's right there, the trust factor is going down the hill. And then when the majority of the people see this, this is not going to be something good. So that's what's something that I would like to see is show me the data, just like you're showing me how many people have been infected and died. Now show me how many people have gotten their shots. That's awesome. And make sure, and make sure that the people who got the first shots can get their second ones. And then since I haven't had one at all, I'll wait until the people got through in an orderly fashion. That seems fair. Right. I agree with you, Amy. Doc, Dr. Vittel, you had um, something to say. Yes, yes sir. Uh, I have a couple of comments and a question. And the comment is about the duration. Uh, prior to Corona, the average time required for vaccine uh, development was three years. And this was done in a warp speed because of a lot of money spent on the technology and although they already developed an existing technology and the speed of the computers too. Uh, somebody, somebody was suggesting. The second um, comment is uh, this uh, second shot, uh, second shot issue. I believe there is something called as an amnestic reaction uh, Dr. Shiva will know. Um, this anamnestic reaction can be activated by second shot any time, even after months or years. Uh, and that's what technology is used as a booster dose for MMR and other, other vaccinations. Those, those are the two comments. And then third is the act. I have patients who are uh, telling me that the health department is asking them to give a, a, bring a letter from the doctor the, whether they can take the aspirin and still get the vaccine. And this is a question for Dr. Shiva. Uh, 
let me, do, uh, Dr. Vittal, you know, uh, let me answer, you know, this uh, question about the uh, the allergies and the, uh, the um, aspirin and that sort of thing. There is no contraindication that you know, if you're on aspirin, you should not be taking you know, vaccine. That's number one. Number two, like I said, the old fashioned way of doing the vaccine is actually using the egg you know, to grow the, the virus. And thereby, I'm sure you heard from the flu shots, if you have allergy to the egg white, don't take it. That is not the case with Pfizer or Moderna because these are bio, uh, synthesized Chemical. chemicals. There's no biological part in it, period. So that is very, very important. I want to repeat that if you were concerned that, you know what, I had allergy to the egg white, so I cannot take this shot. No, 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 no. Pfizer and Moderna got you covered. It is all artificially synthesized. And that's why some people, even the, <laughs> some of the scientifically minded individuals argue, boy, this is bio, uh, bioengineering, where we're going to be cloning. We may be, you know, like somebody's got a chip, you know, where he's going to put in this million. <laughs> 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 big, the big brother is going to use the supercomputers to, you know, watch everybody has to, what's doing. Hello, this is, uh, this is a, a, a amazing technology. Nevertheless, the RNA imprint that it leaves in the body is only to provoke the immunity against the COVID and it will wane away. It won't last for longer. We don't even know if it's going to last for a year because we may need to do this because there are a lot of information that are still unclear how long this is going to protect even this uh, uh, <coughs> vaccines. We are hoping it is one year. So it will be something like a seasonal, but uh, it could be longer because it's a new technology. So to answer your question, aspirin, I wouldn't worry too much about it. And uh, if you're allergic to egg white and all the stuff, don't worry about it. It is not grown in the egg white. And the other thing that they recommend is if somebody has an allergy, they still can take this vaccine and they recommend like a half an hour wait to make sure that they're not getting anaphylaxis. And like uh, I said, good. Like I said, I think, you know, anaphylaxis is, has happened, but all of them have recovered. So it is, there's no death that's been reported so far. So thank you, Balbutal. Go ahead, anybody next, please. Do we have any others you know, that uh, wants to pitch in? And uh, like I said, you know, I'm trying to have this uh, Zoom meeting uh, recorded and uh, we, we are gonna actually present it, submit to the National Library of Congress. So it will be a, your legacy to let you know, your children and their children know what you have done to improve the use of vaccination in America. Yes. So, can go I, ahead. Can I, Julie, can go ahead. Can I share something? Go so, um, I was actually sitting with one of the elderly senior citizens that I work with when the commercial came on about the study being done in New Orleans. They, they have a large uh, sample that they're doing. Uh, uh, so, the news had said that. Um, that uh, the, uh, lots of people from New Orleans were gonna be contributing to this national study. So I thought, well, that, that, that seems like a good thing for me to get involved in uh, because uh, you know all my clients, the senior citizens had not had the vaccine yet. And I have already had, worked with two um, men in their 90s early on in this who ended up having COVID. And I was, I was tested and I even had the um, antibody test and I was always negative and I, I keep getting the test. So I decided to go and be a part of the study. And it, one thing that attracted me to it is it's two people get the vaccine and it is synthetic. And then one person is the placebo. So you have a greater chance of getting the vaccine during the study. Um, so um, 
I took the first one. I didn't have any problems at all. But they did tell me that they had more people have some reaction after they get the second one than the first one. So we'll see, because that's coming up on February 8th. So I just wanted to share that if anybody's interested. They're still enrolling people. Thank you, Julie. I think, you know, as a matter of fact, you're probably referring to the Met Pharma. It's actually run by Dr. John Fro. Yes. And uh, I worked with Dr. John Fro myself. And in fact, uh, sadly, he was infected with COVID himself. And he has a story that we did a, a podcast, YouTube presentation of his life, of uh, his research, and then how he got the COVID and how he's doing right now. So what he has currently is, I'm also actually participating in some of his studies. Okay. So uh, the way that you know, it, it is uh, actually, you're probably looking at uh, a Novavax company study that is actually done phase one and phase two trials with some uh, improved results. So he actually is trying to enroll people Already, you know, that one might ask a question, hey, listen, there's a vaccine available. Why do you need to do the research? But unfortunately, not all people are getting the vaccine. So there are a lot of people that don't have the vaccine and they can join this research study. The only problem is they're not gonna get 100% vaccination. It's only two out of three, you know, they'll get vaccine and then one out of three may get placebo. So that is the only uh, problem with this uh, research study. But nevertheless, the earlier phase one, phase two trials of the Novavax that I know of, and I talked to Dr. John Fro, had excellent results in producing the antibodies. Neutralizing antibodies are the ones that are protective antibodies against the COVID infection. So that is the very positive news. And overall, I have seen several the vaccine, I've, I've read about you know, a lot of these studies, trials all over, uh, India, China, wherever. A lot of these vaccinations do have a positive effect. And the good news is overall, there's not been a death reported with any number of trials that are ongoing right now. That's the greatest news. Because there was a, some somebody suggested well, what's, what's the big deal? I can get COVID infection and then get immunized. I get antibodies. And hello, if you want to do that, you're going to get sick. You're going to go stay home. You're not going to be able to work. And you have a 2% chance that you may die. And especially if you have the medical problems, then you could die faster and a bigger number. Your odds are going to be a lot higher. So I think, you know, the people that are thinking, that, oh, no, 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 I can get a natural COVID, you know, it's going to be so mild that I'll develop uh, antibodies. But let me explain to you. There are, you know, nursing and other staff that used to work with the COVID-19 patients. They all thought, oh, man, you know, I had a little bit of cold or oh, something like that. I must have got the antibodies. Surprisingly, a lot of them did not have antibodies. So. It has been at least my reading that you not only need to have just a little mild COVID, you got to have a good kick with the COVID to get the immunity. You're just not going to get it by, you know, like being around with somebody who may have had a COVID. So it's very important. So the people that are healthcare workers, especially that have developed antibodies, they may have had a, a, a good bout of COVID to develop antibodies. This is so you were saying. Oh, I'm so sorry. you were saying with the COVID, there's not anything by like being a little bit pregnant. You no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the 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 good news is the technology is advancing in antibodies. Also, now we have a antibody titers, just like the hepatitis B. You can get the titers, and if your antibodies are you know certain level then you're, you're good to go. But if your antibody levels are low, you could get, despite not being COVID positive. So that is the thing. And in fact, as a matter of fact, CDC recommends 
for even those people that have been infected with COVID to get the vaccination, but it would be in the best interest to wait at least to 30 to 60 days or maybe longer because they already got the antibodies. And the other concern that I have is that I think- Is that true? Okay, one question. Is that true the people who are still, were just diagnosed with the COVID and are going through the symptoms? One of my classmates in Chicago, he called and he said that they, he got diagnosed with COVID. He was sick and he learned that about COVID status after he had gotten the first shot. Uh -oh. After he got the first shot, then he learned that he had got the code just two days. His results came back. Now he's pretty sick. He's recovering, fortunately, but he's still pretty sick. I think, you know, it, uh, Dr. Arshad raises a very important question about uh, people who got the shot, if they get infected with the COVID. No. Like I said, it is a, a artificially, you know, chemical. Uh, you know, vaccine is a is a chemical thing. It, there's no biological component to it, so there is no way it will cause COVID infection. Number two, in order for the COVID antibodies to develop after vaccination, you got to have ten days, or uh, ten days after the first dose, and seven days, you know, after the second dose, to get the antibodies. So there has been reports of COVID infections within those period of time that you may have gotten the COVID you not know, just a day before and got sick with COVID. That's because you haven't developed antibodies quite yet, you know. And like Julie mentioned, or um, someone mentioned that the second dose is when you're gonna have some more uh, adverse uh, reactions. You know, that is a, that's a common observation that I've, I've come across quite a few people that have said that in the second dose, they've got uh, more uh, aggressive symptoms of you know, body ache and um, uh, fever maybe, and those kind of things. So that's the case. And Ms. Gamble had, had something, I interrupted her. She was trying to talk at the same time I ahead. was. Wasn't it Ms. Campbell who was trying to talk at the same time? So maybe she, she had something to say. No, I'm okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I did want to say, add that um, re very recently, my very dear friend did pass away due to COVID. And she had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis her entire life since she was 11. And she was a miracle because she outlived every other room, room with juvenile rheumatoid arthritic to be 66. She was the oldest living juvenile rheumatoid. And she knew medicine as it pertained to her illness so well. Um, and she she's, has a book that she was going to be, you know, she's got it with the editor and all about her disease process. And it's just heartbreaking to me that COVID um, is, is what happened, you know, that she came so far with her illness, but she was at tremendous risk, you know, and um, so it's very personal to me. And she's just one of the many, many sad situation, sad stories um, that people are experiencing. Julie, I think, you know, it is very personal to me as well, you know, as my son is, is COVID positive, you know, and uh, um, <clears throat> Brenna's family, you know, you know, Michael died, you know, so young in, in 40s, and then my auntie died, you know, in, in mm -hmm. 50s. This is very, very personal. And I, I just want to dedicate this presentation to their spirits, you know, to let them know that yes, we are doing everything and anything that we can to catch up, to boost the immunity of the whole world. Thereby we can stop or uh, eliminate you know, this COVID infection, just like the smallpox. One day I'm sure history will recollect exactly what the the planet has been through with COVID and how it got wiped off. And I think, you know, the kudos to the, the technology 
where they're able to find the solution so fast. And that's the beauty of it. So uh, I'd like to respond to that, Dr. Akula. I, I think that, and, and I don't mean this to be harsh at all, but I, I do feel as though there are some elements of guilt being put in there. So when people say, you know, I had a loved one who died of this, therefore you, Amy Sandridge, need to get a vaccine, I kind of go, uh, I'm not sure if that works that way. It doesn't really matter whether I buy in to the vaccine vaccination strategy. That doesn't help anyone else not get the disease as long as I do my part and I am not a super spreader. And this ethos is coming at us from a variety of places. So, for example, in the New York Times last week, there was an article. I'm not even sure if it was. It didn't say it was an editorial. It didn't say it was an opinion piece. It said it was an article about how people weren't getting vaccinated. And the final paragraph was, if you want to be able to hold your grandchildren then get a vaccination. And I'm sorry, but that's not a news piece. So the pressure from people that in order to be civic minded, I need to go ahead and get a vaccine, to me is not a persuasive argument. The persuasive argument is just like you said, is it effective? Is it going to be dangerous for me and my risk factors? And all the other trappings, I would I try not to make to have it make me make my decision because that wouldn't be scientific, that wouldn't be rational. But I just wanted to share that I'm not sure if if hearing about how how someone else's loved one has died of this is connected to the vaccine. Yeah, I don't really think it is. And and she and the interesting thing about this this person is she didn't want to ever have the vaccination. Um and she was very um not no, she wasn't really big on the mask, you know. She she had her own opinions about things, whether I agree with it or not. It was her opinion, and so it was a lot of irony in it for me. But certainly, I don't think that um, it's very controversial to just some of this stuff, you know, that's going on with. Um, you know, you have to, you should definitely have the vaccine to, you can't hold children or get close to children or you can't get close to elderly if you don't get a vaccination or whatnot. I, I don't, I don't know about all that. You know, I can't really comment on that, but I don't, I don't know. Dr. Um, there is a little hypocrisy involved with that too, because the, the truth is wearing the mask is more protective of other people than if you got the vaccine. Unfortunately, the people who oppose wearing the mask are the first in line to get the vaccine. I was asking Dr. Kool, you wanna um, you know, just go over again about you know, the second dose may have a greater you know, adverse effect. Um, and why is that if it's the same you know, um, stuff that's inside? of the vaccine when you got the first vaccination? It is actually, uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, Dr. Uh, Ms. Campbell has this question as to why there are more side effects after the second dose. And uh, it is uh, unclear at this time as to, these are all obs uh, observational information. There's not a scientific study. So it is very unclear, but it makes sense. Um, I mean, of course, we're trying to use the judgmental mind or the logic in the sense that you have a clash of antibodies, one from the, you know, previous immunity and then the second one, you know, you know second time. So it's like a little clash. But you may have like a little, you know, more side effects, not to the point where they would go into anaphylaxis and die. So I think it is really a containable, but it has been a, 
anecdotal response that I've heard, you know, from several others that they've got, you know, like uh, more side effects during the second time around. In fact, uh, I, I guess, you know, I can pitch in my experience with my second dose, you know, I felt a little bit more, you know, like a little body aches than the first time around. But there's not, because, you know, there are millions of uh, people that are being uh, vaccinated. So there's going to be a lot of information that's going to be available. So you, unfortunately, you know, you just listen to all this CNN and, you know, New York Times and all those things. So those guys are going to take bits and pieces. So we need to actually listen to the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine. But how many people read that? In fact, even the doctors don't read that. So, Everybody's not as smart as you are. So. <laughs> no, it's not really smart, but I think, you know, it's the... It is the American ingenuity that they insist on the medical community to go with the standards. And the standard of research in America is New England Journal of Medicine. And rest of the world is Lancet. Just like the Pfizer and Moderna, they publish their data in the New England Journal of Medicine. And whereas uh, AstraZeneca and this bi biotech publish their data in Lancet. So it's a, it's a, it's a dichotomy. And I'm actually going to actually, you know, uh, go back you know, to this legacy issue. And uh, as you know, Kaleem, that uh, you put in, you know, your story in a, in a podcast on a YouTube. I wanted to invite all those that are listening right now that there is an ongoing project of recording your stories. All stories matter. All of us have issues, problems messages that you want to convey to your future and their future generations. So if you got interest in trying to record a story of yourself, uh, 15, 20 minutes, not more than that, just like a little blip as to what was your life before uh, COVID and what it is now, uh, we are willing to record it. And we already have about uh, 32 stories right now. And a lot of them are you know, available for people to link on the, the coolerfoundation.com. Mm. So you are saying after today, we'll all be able to say we made it to the Library of Congress? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Dr. Kula, would you um, agree that in layman's term, you know, that some, uh, you know, a grid or showing stats, because we really need to get a, a diverse population immunize and without that get that vaccination but we need we need something else we need more to you know even if it's leaders standing up you know showcasing that they've gotten a shot not only the first one but they received the second shot and they're doing well and a whole family so there's something else that we need more that I don't see enough of that I I am um, I've agreed to participate in the uh, Veterans Affairs, the VA here in New Orleans, their trial study. So I agreed to do that, and I'll be doing that soon. So just to showcase others, not only a female veteran, a woman's veteran, but a person that I believe and I trust in what's going on right now. But there's more that needs to be, you know, that showcase in layman's term. I think, you know, uh, you raised a very important uh, uh, ethical value, which is... Uh, equality and, or distributive justice, be fair to all. And uh, the vaccine, you know, is, is new. And uh, very sadly, you know, uh, you know what, actually I'm gonna share this uh, thing that way I wanna show my point. Uh, Thank you. This is the one that I want to share with you and I want you to focus. Look at this, December you know, 18th or something where you know, the immunization started and all of a sudden you got a peak of, and actually Israel is 38% as of yesterday, 38%. Look at the, the one below, United Arab Emirates, Dubai. And they're using Pfizer vaccine and Sinopharm vaccine. And look at Bahrain, 
using Pfizer vaccine, American ingenuity, technology for people that have the money. And I wanted to present to you that there is a dichotomy. Look at all these countries, Israel, UAE, Bahrain, UK, US, you know, you know. Very, very Africa, where is Zimbabwe, where is, um, you know, Kenya, where is, where is uh, any of these countries? So that actually brings to your, your very valid discussion that I think, you know, there is going to be, and here I'm going to present to you the information about the costs, because I believe all of us needs to be involved in the cost effective care. Moderna and Pfizer vaccines range anywhere from $35 to $45 for two shots. Whereas AstraZeneca that is manufactured in India is only costing $3. So you're going to have, here, now I, I've thrown in, of course, you know, Ms. Campbell, you throw in the, the racial inequality. I'm throwing in more relevant information right now to the planet is the rich versus the poor. The rich can have the richest scientific traditions, benefit of it. They can enjoy it. What about the poor? Where is their turn? When are they going to get it? World Health Organization has put together a very similar effort, put some money in all this stuff. They haven't gotten the vaccine pool to be distributed to these poor countries. So I think, you know, there is a need to generate immediately all kind of vaccines, anything over 50% efficacy to mm. get them out as soon as possible and make them available. And I bet those generic ones, you know, of course the Pfizer and uh, Moderna, they did not share this technology with India. So thereby, there's no room for generic. So mRNA technology is harvested as a, a rich scientific tradition of proud nation called America. But if you want the whole world to be proud, we got to do something to get this number of vaccines out first. Because in America, you know, when I was reading that there is a there's survey, there's about 160 million people that wants a vaccine now. They want it now. But how can you get it? Pfizer cannot manufacture that many. Moderna cannot manufacture that many. Somebody, you know, that manufactures the, the massive amount are the guys that really needs to have this technology that we, it will be available. And in fact, you know, I also wanted to recognize AstraZeneca as a company, they have put forward their profit to be just the cost basis. And that is the reason why they have affiliated with the, the largest manufacturer of vaccines called Serum Institute of India to go ahead and manufacture them. So much so, I was, uh, I was told, I was actually watching a, a video that those guys at the Serum Institute of India are manufacturing these vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine at the rate of 5,000 vaccine per minute. 5,000 vaccine per minute. So they want to get them out. And in fact, their goal is 1 billion vaccine by middle of this year. So I hope you know, that happens. And if it happens, you know, of course, they're going to share with you know, like a poorer countries and they got to you know like a, uh, and already that you know they have already sent them to a lot of uh, countries you know around the world. So I think we need to share this technology. You know we brag about it, and the racial inequality you know may be there, but I believe it is more a you know, myths and uh, uh, fears that you know that is exactly what we want to dispel by conferences like this, where we openly put the facts in, in, you know, ahead and let people know that they are reassured that this is a true savior to, for, for you to you know, stop from getting COVID. 
Well said. Thank you, Dr. Kula. Well yeah. said. Oh, and I thank you guys you know, for contributing towards this and it's a great effort and I just want you to know. I just want to thank say thank you for inviting me and I also, you know, thanks Dr. Corey out of Minnesota and, and um, Commander Randy down in Illinois and we have Kayla and RN as well. Um, she's down in Oklahoma. So she was trying to, she's on, I think she may be the iPhone. So just kind of get folks from different parts of the world who've experienced different things so thanks you know um to them as well for um jumping on and this was awesome thank you very much all right thank you guys and uh, appreciate you all <laughs> taking some time to put forward your your ideas hopefully you know we can multiply this and try to communicate with a small group of people to reassure them that it's okay you not know, to get the vaccine and uh, one more thing is that i think you know we possibly maybe you know i need to regather in trying to put forward the resources of where to go get the vaccines. Because I think, I believe in three, four weeks, we are probably going to be able to have a lot more vaccines available. And uh, hopefully that, you know, if they approve another AstraZeneca vaccine, some maybe some other vaccines, then we'll have a large variety and there'll be an incentive to generate, you know, produce more vaccines. So I'm, I'm trying to see that, you no, know, there's going to be oversupply than the demand because we only understand the supply <laughs> economy so hopefully that will happen and happen very soon and we'll uh, probably say goodbye to covid <laughs> bye y'all <laughs>